This is Duke University. Um, so if, you, if, you've, if you're working on developing the virtue of humility, um, I recommend that you read uh, Becky Blank's CV. Um, I won't spend a lot of time going over it. She received her PhD uh, at MIT in 1983, um, became a distinguished uh, economist uh, in the usual academic sense, then became dean of the uh, policy school uh, at, uh, at the University of Michigan for almost 10 years, just after serving as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Clinton administration, and immediately after her deanship went and served in the Obama administration in a number of positions, including acting Secretary of Commerce. Uh, since 2013, she served as the Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin. And so in many ways, she's had a foot uh, when we combine what just said about her involvement uh, with dialogue in the United Church of Christ uh, in all three of the parts of her talk in market, politics, and, and the church. Um, I'll also introduce now, so we get it out of the way, uh, Luke Bretton, who will be uh, the moderator following the talk. So the way we've set it up, uh, Becky will talk uh, uh, some time, and then uh, Luke will have a conversation and then bring the audience in. Um, Luke is a professor of theological ethics and a senior fellow at the Kenan Institute for Ethics here at Duke. Before joining us at the Divinity School, he was on the faculty at King's College London and the convener of the Faith and Public Policy Forum. Uh, his book, Christianity and Contemporary Politics, The Conditions and Possibilities for Faithful Witness, won the Michael Ramsey Prize for Theological Writing. His research now is on the intersections between Christianity, radical democracy, globalization, responses to poverty, and patterns of interfaith relations. His most recent book is, the Resurrection, uh, is Resurrecting Democracy, Faith, Citizenship, and the Politics of a Common Life by Cambridge University Press. So without further ado, I'll ask Becky to come and get us started. Thank you very much, Tom and Edward, for that introduction. I am delighted to be here. I admit I'm partly delighted to be here because it's fun just to go do something entirely different from my normal daily activities and to get my mind out of what I'm doing as chancellor every day and to come back and revisit a topic that I have visited regularly off and on for really the last 30 years or more. Um, I've been thinking about the relationship between economics, politics, and Christian theology since the mid-1980s when I was asked to serve on a task force within the United Church of Christ that was drafting a statement on Christian faith and economic life. And I have enjoyed the opportunity at various times, either in writings or at conferences and other things, to, to come back to this topic. And um, you sort of heard my professional career resume. Let me tell you a little bit about my um, religious background. I'm a lifelong Protestant. Um, and I've come to realize that I'm not just a Protestant on Sunday morning in my church attendance, but I'm culturally a Midwestern Protestant. And those of you who've grown up in the Midwest might know a little bit of what that means. Um, some of my ancestors were among the first founders of the German Evangelical Church in the Midwest, um, which ultimately became part of the United Church of Christ. And I have been part of churches that were also affiliated with the Presbyterians, the United Methodists, the American Baptists. I married a Lutheran. And I worked for three years as an organist at an Episcopal church. So I sort of covered the Protestant spectrum in, in one way or another. At the same time, my entire professional life um, and career has been spent as an economist with a very strong interest in policy. And in more recent years, I admit I've spent more time as an administrator and a manager than as a working economist. Um, but those who work with me constantly tell me I still think like an economist. And um, I will admit that's not always said in a complimentary way. Today, however, um, I want to start by talking a little bit about economic theories of markets. This is just a reminder of a little bit of Econ 101 for those of you who had it long ago. I know for some of you this will be quite, no, you'll, you'll know this well. And um, then I want to talk about sort of how this interacts with political theories about the role of government in markets and segue from that into a more traditional Christian framework and say how does Christian approaches contrast with or complement um, some of these more market and government oriented approaches. So um, let me start with markets. And I want to start by saying unambiguously, and we can come back and argue about this if you want to, that I truly believe in the power of markets. 
That is, I believe in an economic system in which supply and demand operate in a way to set prices, and the price mechanism creates incentives for economic activity, right? That is essentially the model of microeconomics 101. And there's some wonderful things that emerge out of markets when they are functioning effectively. When they're functioning effectively, we can come back and talk about that, um, they encourage productivity and innovation. If you can make things cheaper, you're going to sell more. If you could have a new idea and can make something better or something that people want that they didn't have before, that's going to be to your benefit. So there's a real incentive here for productivity, for innovation. There's also um, an incentive towards trade and specialization. And I realize that trade has, um, in the current political debate, been a somewhat dirty word. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm not in agreement with that. Um, if it weren't for trade, um, we up in Wisconsin will still be figuring out how we grew sugarcane to have sugar in our coffee. And you down here in North Carolina would be figuring out how you ever make metal without having any iron ore from the Great Lakes. Um, you know, trade really has, and, and marketization has rescued us from a subsistence agricultural economy and been an enormous force for wealth creation. And indeed, the very rapid decline of poverty at the world level over the last 10 to 20 years has been driven by expansions of markets and economic growth, primarily in what were 20 years ago less developed nations, and particularly China, which are now rapidly becoming more developed nations. And, and you can sort of see that phenomenon in different parts across the world where markets have been an enormous force for increases in standards of living. Um, we can come back and talk about, you know, there, there are a lot of caveats and buts and hesitations that one can put on all of that. But for markets to operate effectively, there have to be certain preconditions that are met. And, you know, without that, there is what the economists call market failure. Um, and those preconditions we could talk about for a long time. Some of the main ones are such things as transparent information about quality and value. If I'm going to buy something and there's a price, I've got to know whether it's really going to work or not. I've got to trust it. There's got to be some credible information here that this is actually the product being advertised, right? Um, similarly, um, markets rely on choice. I have to have the ability to look out there and choose amongst things if, um, so that I basically can buy elsewhere if I don't like what I see in front of me in this particular store. Um, if I am constrained by, um, you know, there's only one provider of the good, or um, there's um, some political power going on that basically says you've got to buy from my friend over here, um, that's going to cause real problems with the operation of markets and are going to mean the outcomes you get are not necessarily very helpful in, in a larger social sense. And then, you know, a very common issue often talked about is the issue of what economists call externalities. Markets assume that everything um, that is really important is what goes on between the buyer and the seller. And if there's a transaction between a buyer and a seller, that actually um, affects a lot of other people, markets don't work very well. So, you know, if I'm trying to sell something to Tom and he and I agree on a price, but in the process of making this, I spew a lot of pollution out into the air and you all get sick because of it, my price is not going to reflect that in my transaction with him. And that's a problem. That means I'm, I'm not pricing things well, markets aren't working the way they should. The similarly, there are positive externalities. If I vaccinate my children, it might be good for my children and for my family, but it also happens to be good for the rest of you as well because you're a little less likely to be sick if my children don't get sick. And um, so, you know, there, there, there are, you know, the, the, so the price of vaccinations, you might think, is, you know, you, you, it's not very well set in an individual transaction between just the doctor and myself. Now, the extent to which these sorts of problems occur, how often is there lack of real information? How often do people not really have choice? How much are their externalities? That's a very hotly contested issue in sort of the political economy discussions about markets. And indeed, um, you know, Milton Friedman won a, a Nobel Prize for basically a series of arguments that say market failure is very rare and that markets work well. And 25, 30 years later, Joe Stiglitz won a Nobel Prize for essentially a series of um, articles that say market failure is everywhere, right? And it's a constant and big problem. So um, much of the interesting work in economics is really about what is this thing we see in front of us? If it's a market, in what way does it operate? In what ways does it meet the conditions that we would want a market to meet? Where does it fail? And if it fails, what does that mean? And what are things that we could do that could overcome that market failure and make this market work more interestingly? That is a, a lot of some of the really interesting stuff that goes on in economics. Um, now, I find this an incredibly powerful framework, even though I'm now going to spend quite a bit of time critiquing what's wrong with this. Um, it is a framework that, on average, gives you some pretty good predictions about behavior and what you can expect. And um, it works in a lot of different situations. <coughs> so um, 
you know, there's a lot of reasons why the market model has been so dominant, not just in economics, but even out there in a broader world where one might say beliefs in markets is its own set of secular religion um, among, among certainly many, many writers in the business press. But um, let me talk about what role government plays in a world where we have markets, because if markets are working well, what, what do you need government for, right? And, um, you know, there's a number of answers to that. And of course, different people will disagree about these answers as well. The first one, which I think most everyone accepts, is that the government should establish an institutional structure which essentially allows markets to function effectively. And by institutional structure, I mean a set of rules that enforce the behavior of markets. So laws that protect and guard private property. So um, if I buy a piece of land, nobody can take it away from me, right? Or they'll, they'll suffer consequences. Laws that enforce contracts. So if I sign a contract with Tom um, and he abrogates that contract in some way, I can bring a force of law against him. Um, uh, the establishment of a common monetary system. So those little green things that I hand to you when I want to buy something actually mean the same thing to both you and I. Um, there's, there's a whole series of things that we think the government does that are actually necessary for markets to function, that are just sort of those basic um, grease the wheels organizations that are needed in, in, in a common life together, okay? Now, secondly, um, if you go beyond just that, you know, you need this for markets to function, there's a second argument, this is government should go further, and government should correct market failure when it can, right? And much of the regulatory activity you see government undertaking is usually justified on the basis, in, from an economics perspective, of a correction of government failure. So, there's a lot of cases where we force companies to provide information they may not naturally provide. And this is everything from little stuff like there's a date on your milk carton telling you when that milk is going to go bad so you know whether you want to buy it or not, to really big things like if you're a major international corporation, um, you have to reveal under certain SEC rules you know, a whole set of information about how you function, what sort of profits you make, what sort of problems you're facing, so that if investors are going to decide whether to invest in your company or not, they have pretty complete information on what's really going on inside the company. So, you know, government can enforce information, government can do things that deal with externalities, they can force me to put controls on my factory that spews out pollution so that the cost of my products go up, and then when Tom buys my product, he's paying not just for what he's getting, he's also paying a little bit for the pollution that I'm creating, and that, that creates a better price and, uh, you know, a market that's a little bit closer to where it should be. So, you know, if you believe market failures occur frequently, the more government intervention of this sort you want, all right? Um, so, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the argument of how much regulation you need is partly an argument of how much does market failure occur and can the government correct it effectively? That's also an important issue. Now, third argument for government, and this is going to get a little bit more controversial, um, the government should go beyond facilitating the behavior of markets or correcting market failure and it should actually correct gaps or inadequacies in market outcomes through redistribution. So there are a whole bunch of people who cannot participate effectively in markets. Markets work for those who can bring productive labor, sell their labor for a price, get earnings back, and then use that to purchase goods. If you are elderly, if you're disabled, if you are a child, um, there are many reasons why you may not be able to participate in markets. We can go talk about involuntary unemployment as well. Um, and under those circumstances, there is an argument that the government should help redistribute to take care of individuals who are part of our common community and part of our social fabric, but for whom markets may not be, ad you know, they, they can't participate in markets in a way that allows them to live adequately. So we do all sorts of things. We redistribute from workers to retirees. It's called social security. We redistribute from richer to poor. That's called welfare. We redistribute from the employed to the unemployed. That's called worker compensation. We redistribute from adults to children. That's what the public school system in some ways is about. Um, and many people agree with some of that. Many people will argue against some others of it. You know, the problem here with um, using the government to correct um, market gaps is this is a slippery slope, right? And um, once you allow redistributions to start happening, it starts becoming a matter of pork barrel politics. And of course, every group that might have a little bit of political power is going to argue that there's some redistribution needed for their group. And so you have all sorts of redistribution to groups that you may or may not think are socially deserving in some larger sense and that it benefits all of society. It depends on where you sit, right? So, um, you know, helping to prop up peanut prices, 
um, or subsidized peanut farmers might be very good for peanut farmers, but it's less clear this is compelling a reason as a redistribution to the elderly, right? And, and so, you know, that one of the problems with you know, getting involved with correcting market gaps and subsidizing certain activities is you immediately get into arguments as to which activities need subsidies and which don't. And it's very hard once you open this up to, to sort of start drawing lines. And, you know, I'm sure everybody here has their favorite examples of pork barrel politics that they don't like or that they do like, right? Um, so, fourth argument for government. And um, this is very confrontational now with regard to markets is the government actually needs to ban markets in some places. They need to limit markets where they're inappropriate. And what do I mean by that? There's certain spheres of activity where we really don't want price to determine access, all right? Um, and indeed, there are other values that we think trump the market values. So for instance, um, the civil justice space of voting, of jury trials, of arrests, we don't want that ruled by a price mechanism. So you shouldn't be able to buy the result of a jury trial. You shouldn't be able to buy whether you are arrested or not, or um, you should not be able to buy someone's vote. Now, do we all know some of this happens in various forms in corruption? But we try very hard, at least in, our, um, in the rules of our life together, to try to set that set of civil life completely outside of markets and say you can't buy and sell that. Right? That is covered by a different set of rules and values. Similarly, um, the space around human beings often has a variety of bans and protections from markets. So in many places, we ban prostitution, we ban the sale of organs, we ban slavery. You cannot sell yourself and your body into slavery. Um, we have a lot of arguments about whether abortion should be provided by the market, and it's a negotiation between me and my doctor at a certain price, or whether it is a banned activity that should not be allowed. Um, we ban child labor. We don't allow me to sell my children to someone else when I get tired of them, um, as much tempting as that is at times. Um, so <clears throat> there are a whole series of areas where we commonly just say no markets at all. Prices are not the right mechanism, and, and you know, gov you know, you just markets shouldn't be there, and government protects that by a set of rules. Now, these different approaches to government lead to, you know, have quite different um, images of the views of government versus the market. So if you're talking about just the, the institutional structures, such as you know, a legal system and a monetary system, <coughs> there's some way in which you can almost view that as a separate sphere model, that the government sets certain things in place, and then markets operate, right? And you know, the, the markets sort of operate on their own, and once these institutions are in place, there's not a lot of other um, intervention of the government. You can even argue that um, you know, the, the government is complementary here, and that, that you, know, you, you need the government actions in order for the markets to operate effectively. Similarly, if you think government can correct market failure, there's a complementary activity there of the government with the market. Now, once you start letting the government redistribute and create market gaps, or even more ban markets, you get into a little bit more confrontational um, sense of the government versus the market as to who's doing what and um, you know, you know, the, 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 the government can be viewed as actually um, limiting markets and, you know, and, and um, not necessarily complementing them. It's actually a statement markets are harmful in some cases, and we have to go beyond them. Now, um, there's a lot of arguments about um, what should be the right limits of government behavior in all of these areas. I think many people would agree with certain government behavior in every one of those four areas, but I suspect we would greatly disagree as to how far the government should go and what is the full scope of acceptable activity in each of those four areas. Um, but um, it's a fascinating set of questions as to if you believe in a market system, where does government come in? And I will say a large amount, uh, this is not an arcane issue um, based back on the Constitutional Convention of um, 1783. These are very current issues that are being debated by the presidential candidates about what should be the nature of government regulation. Should we or should we not ban certain activities just completely outside the market? To what extent should the government do regulation or not do regulation and where? Um, those are very, very hot issues. And these, you know, this question of what's the role of markets and what's the role of government is highly important and, and worth spending some time thinking about. But I want to move on from that, from the language of which I've been using, which is the language of political economy and economics, um, to a very different language of theology and talk a little bit about how those different models of markets and government contrast with um, you know, sort of certain Christian precepts and values. And as you all know, there's not a single set of 
Christian viewpoints here. Um, I want to lay out a few things that I think would um, be part of most Christian approaches, but in no way do I want to argue that this is a, you know, the, the, these are set in stone and everyone would agree to this. Um, first of all, quite in contrast um, to the market, um, Christianity typically values community and says that individuals are not simply, you know, community is not just a set of independent and autonomous individuals, that there is something to community where the sum is greater than, the, the, the whole is greater than just the sum of the parts. Um, and uh, you particularly see this more in Catholic theology than in Protestant theology, but even in Protestant theology, the sense that um, one owes responsibilities to the larger community, even if it's just your church, local church community, or your community of faith, um, beyond what you might owe to yourself as a self-interested individual. That is very closely related to a second tenet that I think is embedded in almost all Christian thought, which is that self-interest alone is not an adequate con concept for individual action. That you have to be concerned about other interest as well as self-interest. And um, you know, Christianity calls upon us for a deep awareness of others. If, if the first and greatest commandment is, you will love the Lord your God, the second one that follows immediately from it is love your neighbor as yourself. And love your neighbor as yourself is a call to other interest. It doesn't say act in your own best interest, right? It's a call to other interest and a concern about others that is as deep as the concern you have about yourself, and even um, at times acting in a self-sacrificial way. And of course, just being a few days past Easter, the whole image of self-sacrifice and the role of self-sacrifice to, to the betterment of the community is you know, one of the stories of Jesus' death and what it accomplished. So, um, you know, this question of how do you think about other interest in a world where markets call you to self-interest, how do you think about a community where markets say we're just an autonomous set of individuals each making our own choices becomes an interesting set of issues. Now, third, third thing I'd say about Christian thought, and again, I think almost in some form or another you see this in almost all Christian traditions, an emphasis on the poor and the dispossessed a particular concern, what the Catholics call a special preference or a special option for the poor, right? And this starts from the very beginning in the biblical text where the Deuteronomical laws call for particular concern for the widows and the orphans and actually set up ways to care for them, those who don't have other um, forms of support, all the way through Jesus' ministry where again and again he's sort of calling out the more marginalized and saying these are your neighbors, these are the ones you have to care for. Um, and that emphasis on the poor and the marginalized as a concern, a particular concern of Christianity um, is, is, is a third issue here. And again, not, not something that necessarily is going to come to you out of market theology, right? It's going to come to you out of Christian theology. Um, fourthly, um, choice in markets is neutral, right? If Tom wants to sell it and I want to buy it, it's up to us, right? There's no, nothing that's good or bad about that. Markets are markets and choices are choices. And if there's a buyer and a seller, it should happen. Um, in Christianity, there's a moral evaluation of choice. Choices are not neutral, by and large. There are moral values involved in choice, and some choices are better than others. Right? This is not economics language, I promise you. Some choices lead towards goodness. They are life-affirming. Some choices lead towards sinfulness, and they are, you are called away from those choices. And um, the moral evaluation of choice is, I think, one of the most interesting contrasts between you know, sort of the market approach and Christian approaches and thinking about what that means if you are a Christian living in a market economy and how you bring moral choice into a market where that is amoral, I mean, indifferent in its choices is, is, is yeah, say an interesting one to talk about. Finally, last issue of contrast here. <coughs> There's a different scale of well-being inside Christianity than inside markets. Um, markets are pretty clear, more is better, right? And more here means material goods, right? I'm always better off if I have more choices, if I have more things, if I've got more money. Um, uh, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, just everything says that, that's, that's what being better off means, right? And um, Christianity says that um, well-being is not really necessarily about more or less of material goods. It is more or less of abundance, where abundance is spiritual abundance as opposed to material abundance. So, you know, the, the, this lovely statement by Jesus, I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. He's not talking about all of us being rich, right? He's talking about all of us being closer to God, to having more abundant spiritual life. And there's a recognition that, 
you know, I think the Bible rarely says that material goods are evil or bad. That what it says is that material goods can sometimes make spiritual well-being harder, and it can get in the way, and that you can misuse your wealth um, and make bad choices, to go back to the fact that there is a moral evaluation of choice, or you can use your wealth in ways that makes good choices. But nonetheless, the measure of how well off you are is not that wealth. The measure is how you use it and where it gets you in a relationship to God. You know, do you have an abundance of the spirit as opposed to an abundance of things? So in short, there's a, sometimes a direct conflict between what constitutes right action and right thinking um, and appropriate human action as interpreted by a standard market economist and as interpreted by a Christian theologian. And of course, that leads to the question of how does a Christian live faithfully in a market society that values individualized decision-making, self-interest, and neutral choices. Now, <clears throat> there's a huge literature on that, certainly in theology, if not in economics. Um, and I'm not going to follow those questions right now. I suspect we might talk about them um, a little bit later with Luke. I want to segue from this sort of view of the individual and how does the individual view themselves with relation to markets and talk about the role of the church, because I think the role of the church really brings together these questions about markets and individuals and government in a variety of ways. So um, in a world where there are some fundamental conflicts between the messages of markets that we hear every day and the messages of religion, the church and organized religion, I think plays a particularly important and mediating role. And let me talk about a couple of things that I think are important in terms of the role of the church here um, and sort of the role of organized religion. <clears throat> First of all, and this should be clear from what I said earlier, the church provides a moral framework out of which individuals can make personal and political choices. It teaches an alternative framework to market-based thinking. It talks about community, it talks about other interests, it talks about moral choices, it talks about a preference for the poor, it talks about spiritual abundance. All those things that are core to Christian theology is part of the teaching and preaching mission of the church. And you bring that to individuals, and again, this depends a little bit on which branch of Christianity you're in, it is then your job to discern what is your right action in the midst of that, right? How do you use that teaching in your own life? Um, now, there are um, some number of approaches that will tell you that it's basically up to you to use this to determine how you get right with God. And um, the main issue of the church is for you to be in right relationship to God. And how you live the rest of your life is a little bit less important. Um, I come from a Protestant tradition that is quite different than that. And in my tradition, being right with God means more than just my personal religious beliefs and my prayer life and my relationship to God. It necessarily means struggling with the question, how does my Christian faith, what does it mean for right action in the world in which I live? Both in my own individual actions, what does it mean for, you know, yes, my prayer life, and yes, my attendance on Sunday morning, and yes, my behavior with my family, but it cannot be limited to that it must spill over necessarily if you truly believe that you know, there's a preferential option for the poor, if you truly believe moral choices are not, you know, are, are, are not um, that there's a moral valuation of choice, that you know, all of these things, that it must spill over into actions that go into my relationships both with other people, also into my choices about work life and about civic life, that being a Christian must suffuse your whole life if you are truly Christian, and should affect the choices that you make and the, even the way you think about the world. So being Christian has implications for political and public choices, for choices that relate to the government and our common life together, as well as for choices that relate um, to the individual economic choices that I may make, as well as my personal behavior with family and friends, right? That there's, there's a whole spectrum of issues here, and they cannot be easily divorced from one another. Now, there's a huge area of theological study on how religious belief should or shouldn't affect other spheres of action. But I want to note that these debates become very complex as society becomes more and more religiously heterogeneous. As much as I reject the idea that religious life and economic life are two separate spheres that need not connect, I also recognize that there are very real dangers in entering any debate over economic or political issues with the idea that you're speaking out of your religious commitments. Even faithful people who agree that we are called to reach out to those who are without voice, the widows and the orphans of modern society, can be in honest disagreement about whether, what this means for housing policy, or for food stamp policy, or for tax policy. 
So the translation from religious principle into my engagement in civic life my policy advocacy, the policy advocacy of the church, if your church goes there, must always be done with humility and with a lot of listening to others and with a recognition that you may be wrong, right? And you've got, you've got to engage in that way. Um, but the role of the church goes beyond helping individuals just develop their own moral framework for action and for activity. The church does have a preaching and teaching role in the public space, not just in the space of the church within the congregation, but in the public space and particularly in a market society where some groups have experienced substantial economic success and others have experienced years of economic stagnation, if not losses in income, the church occasionally needs to be a counterbalance to some of the market messages about what matters in life and how we think about our life together. So there are plenty of public voices out there that come from the market. We all know that diamonds are a girl's best friend. We know that Coke is the real thing, and this is the favorite for my latest Economist magazine. Joy is BMW. Um, those marketing campaigns are pretty relentless, you know, starting with young children and Saturday morning cartoons. The church needs to hold out an alternative vision of what consists of the good life, and it needs to preach to that in the public space, not just to the Christians who sit in the congregation, but to the very heterogeneous group of people out there and needs to find ways to talk about this that do not necessarily always use purely religious language. Because when you're talking to a very heterogeneous society, you've got to find language that indicates why these values are of use, even to those who may not be in your congregation on Sunday morning. Um, it needs to speak to those values that are often in conflict with the values of a more materialistic and market-based society. And I, one of the things that I must say, I, I think that certainly I will speak for myself and sort of coming out of the mainline Protestant tradition is that we have so, you know, if I'm not unique in saying this, almost entirely lost our public voice, our voice in the public space. And figuring out how we reclaim that in any useful way um, is, is a very important topic to be thinking about. Thirdly, um, in addition to providing sort of moral guidance to individuals and having a public voice, the church does need to leave, live its commitment to work on behalf of the voiceless and the dispossessed. Now, I don't believe that church outreach can or should substitute for government assistance to those in need, but I do believe the church must be involved in such outreach. And that means everything from welcoming a diverse worshiping community, it could mean running a homeless shelter, it could be joining the Bread for the World offering of letters. I mean, different churches will choose different ways of doing this, but there is clearly a mandate out of Christian faith to be involved in reaching out to those who have less voice, those who have less ability to operate within this market economy. And um, how you do that is an interesting question. So, um, the question of how markets and government and church interrelate in, in our common life together, I, we, we, we could talk about this for hours, right? Um, but I want to segue from that into sort of the last few things I want to say here, which is particularly to talk about the current environment and where we find ourselves and how some of these issues impinge on the topics that are very much in the public debate right now. We're in the time of very rapid change. We've been in the midst of huge economic changes, a period of slow growth and rising inequality, a very deep and wrenching recession, a time when the incomes of a lot of families are stagnant and in many cases have declined. At the same time, you have those economic changes. There's just been in the last 20 years enormous technological change that leaves many people quite honestly a bit confused about how to navigate the world in a time of instant communication and messaging and social media. And you know, the world has changed and believe it, nobody knows that better than someone running a big public institution as to what comes at you and how fast it comes at you and how, how very segregated different um, communities are in terms of what they hear and read and how you get information out to all of those communities is a fascinating challenge. Um, in addition to economic changes and technological changes, there've been these really, um, scary climate changes, right? Environmental changes, which creates fear about the future um, of things that are just seem fundamental to who we are. You know, our climate, our weather, when that changes, you know, what can we rely on? And um, things that we've taken for granted about our environment are suddenly in flux. That's really scary. And then fourthly, there are all of these challenges to our sense of security and um, who we are and what we can trust 
as international terrorism has created these wars without boundaries, right? It's no, no idea where the terrorists will strike next. And that degree of uncertainty and fear um, is very unsettling, to say the least. So all of us, all of us have been threatened and frightened and confused by these sorts of changes. Our market economy in the midst of this has continued to serve some people well, very well, in fact, rewarding those who are more educated and more technologically savvy. And in fact, some number of people have benefited from these changes, as always happens, but it has dispossessed many others whose jobs, opportunities, and wages have shrunk. The um, current anti-government wave is partly a response to the fact that the government hasn't, not only hasn't prevented these changes, it has not even dealt very well with them in many people's opinion. I mean, it's partly a response to the fact the government has simply proven itself inadequate to reach quick solutions, because what would we like to do? We want someone to solve these problems, right? Solve climate change, you know, settle down these technological changes, settle down these international terrorist issues. And, you know, it, it may be unfair to ask for quick solutions from government to that, but nonetheless, we would like that to happen in the absence of that response People feel like government is no longer as trustworthy or as valuable as perhaps they once thought it was. The result is a long-term decline in trust in public institutions at best, or rising anger at worst, which we are seeing in this current election. Ironically, declining trust in government makes it harder for public institutions to function effectively. So there's a reinforcing issue here. You stop trusting government, and that makes government even less effective, and that simply reinforces your view that government can't solve the problem. Now, there are many things to talk about. How do you respond to this as a public leader? And certainly part of the response has to be transparency in what you're doing and real leadership about what's going on and willingness to speak truth um, as far as public leaders understand it if they're going to regain citizen confidence. You know, confidence in any institution can erode very quickly, on this, particularly in a world with instant media communications, but it can only be rebuilt slowly over time. Now, of course, when people's distrust in public institutions grows because those institutions can't resolve these problems, the same backlash and distrust, not surprisingly, can be aimed at other institutions, such as the church. Now, the church clearly has a role in this world, in all of this change, of offering solace, comfort, assistance to those who are challenged and hurt by these changes. There's no question that that pastoral role of the church is deeply important. But it also must play a role of working with people to talk about these changes, to help people face these changes so they're not going away, and to figure out what right behavior means in a less secure economy, a more threatened ecology, or a more diverse society. That will cause controversy. Those who seek to avoid change and to hide from economic, environmental, or security threats may be disturbed when the church addresses these issues. Those who've embraced these always connected technologies may be disturbed when some in the church express hesitations about what is the true right use of those technologies. Those who are deeply enmeshed in private sector market institutions and have benefited from them may be disturbed when some in the church raise questions about the appropriate role and behavior of these institutions in our economy over the last several decades. As with public institutions, the right response from church leadership has to be leadership transparency, conversation. Rather than ignoring the issues, they need to confront these issues, but it must be clear throughout that the statements and the action, the teaching and the preaching role of the church grows out of its commitment to the word, first and foremost, and not out of another and larger political agenda. So the complexities of this modern world make for difficult questions and very complex ethical dilemmas. Markets can be a force for good. I believe that deeply. I think we see that regularly. Indeed, the spread of successful markets in the developing world is a primary reason for great reductions in global poverty. But markets can also be destructive. Economic growth brings new opportunities for increased income and for the application of human ingenuity to problems, but it also causes displacement and the breaking apart of older communities. In most cases, Economic change brings both good and bad at the same time. Globalization, innovation, marketization are a source of good outcomes for some and of increased insecurity and economic difficulties for others. Our response to these issues as individuals, as a society, as Christians, must be based on a framework that allows us to discern both the good and the bad, rather than rejecting change and saying it's not occurring, which is not going to be a very helpful response, um, and hiding from it because it has negative effects, the goal should be 
to help people deal with, you know, to comfort those who are affected by this, help them deal with whatever the changes are that they're facing, at the same time that we seek ways to limit and to mitigate the negative effects um, and to encourage the positive benefits to be greater. In a world dominated by market-based thinking, the church is a key institution that shapes individual moral frameworks, that preaches and teaches about the ways in which economic life overlaps with a host of moral and theological issues, such as poverty, environmental stewardship, and individual charity. The church must remind us that our society, through market institutions and government institutions, cannot be just about wealth creation. We must care about how wealth is spent, working to enhance human potential among all of our citizens. In the end, the market has to serve the people rather than the people serving the market. The wealth creation of the market is of value only if it allows humans to be more rather than just to have more. In a time of rapid change and a daunting list of national and global challenges, it is imperative that we have effectively functioning economic systems and government institutions. But it is equally important that we have effective and vibrant religious institutions. And in fact, that may be just as important in meeting these challenges and helping people live in the midst of change. And let me stop there and open up for comments. How do you want to do this? Sit. Let's sit down. Sit down. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Becky. That was a wonderful, wonderful, lucid exposition. And um, there's lo lots to talk about. But I, let, let me kind of frame that a little bit. It's one, one way of listening to what you heard <laughs> was a, a wonderfully sophisticated midrash, as, mm -hmm. as the rabbis would say, on Jesus' uh, verse that you can't serve God and mammon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this whole question of how, yeah. in the contemporary world, particularly in the 20th century, we've tried to ensure that uh, money doesn't, we don't serve money, we don't serve mm -hmm. mammon, yeah. but rather we make sure that the, the circulation of money and, and yeah. uh, the kind of processes of the market serve the flourishing of people. Mm -hmm. Now I just, I want to press you a bit, and your, your mm -hmm. account you gave in many ways was, was a wonderfully prudential account, mm -hmm. and I wonder if I can agitate you sure. to, to head in a more prophetic direction, both venerable biblical genres, but we, we heard one on, a lot about one, if I can agitate I'm not allowed to be filmed saying anything prophetic. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I, and part of this mm -hmm. is calling on, on your, um, on you both as Christian and as economist. Mm -hmm. you, you gave a strong account of the importance of governments in limiting uh, uh, certain markets or mm -hmm. banning certain markets. Mm -hmm. And you, you made very clear that the church needs to um, give an alternative to the materialistic vision mm -hmm. that, that's often out there. Uh, but I wonder what role markets, the field of economic, uh, economics yeah. itself, they have, they're not as neutral as I think as, you, as your talk seemed mm -hmm. to suggest. Is there actually an anthropology and a moral vision inherently at yeah. work in market mechanisms <laughs> and at work within economics as a field as a kind of dominant, as you said, as a dominant yeah. way of thinking about the world? So I, I mentioned that economics has a certain religious aspect to it, and I think right. there are those who are true believers in economic models of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, there is a, there's a simple model of economics which is incredibly powerful because of what it promises in its simplicity, which is you know, this, this, this story of if all of us simply do our own thing, we follow our own self-interest, don't care anything about anyone else, we're going to end up in a really good place, right. right? We're going to have efficient outcomes with good prices and wealth creation and, you know, sort of this, it's the, I think, naively simplistic model of, you know, what Adam Smith was talking about and it, not a very good representation, right. to be honest, of what he was saying. But, um, you know, there, there is a belief, you know, that markets by themselves will save us, yeah. right? It's, and, it's good and, news and market narrative. outcomes are good yeah, yeah, in the yeah. way that religion talks about good outcomes with a moral mm -hmm. emphasis on that, that market outcomes are good, right? I will note that I think that there is a equally naive Christian version of right. this, right? Which is, um, you know, quite similar in some ways, which is, what if we all just did good, right? What, what if we stopped sinning? What if we just all did good every day? Everything would be fine. We'd solve our problems. And I must say, I find that is naively utopian in the sense that, 
Good intentions do not guarantee good long-term outcomes. I can tell you lots of examples where people did something with the best intention in the world, and it ended up having bad effects, right? right? So just as you know, market outcomes have their problems, I, I think you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to worry. There's, I don't think there's any result here that is simply about individual behavior. You've got to worry about collective behavior as well. And what institutions do you build that allow us to work together in collective behavior? Because each of us behaving on our own just isn't enough to get to some of the answers that we're going to need to get to given the challenges we're facing. So that's where government has to be central to this and, and civic action starts mattering. So just build, building on that comment, you, mm -hmm. in one, one way you gave a, a very strong account of what might say a kind of justification for actually quite a kind of classic version of a kind of social democratic market liberal mm -hmm. state, if you like. Um, in, in some ways, and, and you touched on at the end there how certain kinds of problems, something like climate change, something mm -hmm. like terrorism, we're, we're, we're realizing that the standard ways of addressing mm -hmm. collective problems, mm -hmm. uh, how do we have uh, potable water, how do we educate children, these kinds of things, it's either been this classic debate between, uh, well, we need more state action yeah. on the one hand, or we need more market more action. action yeah. um, and then we have, do mm -hmm. you live in Sweden or do you live in America? Mm -hmm. And we have variations mm -hmm. on a theme between mm -hmm. those two poles. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder, in, in the contemporary context, we've it's, we started, particularly from Reagan and Thatcher onwards, questioning the viability mm -hmm. and, and the place of the state as a means of solving collective mm -hmm. problems. I think particularly since 2007 mm -hmm. and, and onwards, we've begun to question or be more skeptical mm -hmm. uh, about the place of the market as mm -hmm. the means of solving collective problems. Um, and both of, those, both of those solutions seem to rest on the, the primary problem being one of scarcity. Mm -hmm. What's the way in which we take scarce resources mm -hmm. and have the most efficient, effective, and therefore most just way of distributing scarce resources? But yeah. neither of them really address the problem of power. Mm -hmm. And states tend to concentrate power in the hands of bureaucrats, mm -hmm. and markets actually do tend to concentrate that they hands of powers in different, group, but yeah. different groups, yeah. 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 And, yeah. and that's, our, that's much more mm -hmm. our concern, is the question of power. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder how you would think about the kind of addressing those kinds of problems and the kind of institutions we need yeah. to, to address collective problem solving when actually our very yeah. ways of imagining the yeah. ways of addressing collective problems yeah. seem to have been run dry. Yeah, well, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I think that the interactions between markets and government are highly important is that, you know, as I think, I think relying on markets alone and the private sector to solve problems has its limits, but, you know, the tendency towards power and corruption inside government we can see all around us as well. You know, certainly if you're, you know, why have markets failed in a lot of African countries? Partly because markets can't work in a, inside a corrupt, you know, system. I mean, that just stops all, you know, all, all of the activity you actually want to see happening. Um, so that's where you've got to find the balance between the two. And, you know, in some ways markets are a break on certain types of collective action. And collective action is a break on certain types of And, you know, if you say neither of those two work, I don't know where you are then. Right. right? right. Then you're back to an individualistic, we just might as well farm our little group, whether it's our church or our tribe, and, you know, and, and sort of put up the walls around us. And, and that, that is, of course, a little bit of the, you know, let's just us in the United States put our walls up, shut everyone else out and try to figure it out. Just, you know, so, you know, all of those problems will go away if we kept all of those people out. And I think that that's not very realistic either. So um, you are back at saying, how do you create an interaction between markets and government that work effectively on these big problems? And um, uh, yes, we have faced some problems in markets um, in recent years. Some of that is due to mis- functioning of certain institutions that were supposed to be regulating and breaking markets that didn't work as effectively as they should have. So mm -hmm. that balance wasn't working effectively. Um, we've also got problems in terms of a, a, a democratic system that for a whole variety of reasons is no longer dealing very well with long-term problems, right? And our ability to solve things that require action now that may revive some pain to certain groups of people in order to solve a problem that's five to ten years down the road seems very close to zero. And that is a real, you know, we, we've got to figure out within these democratic institutions that we're used to working in what we can do to recreate our ability to reach hard decisions to solve long-term problems, because almost all of those challenges I talked about were were issues that, um, you know, there's no easy answers, 
anything they do is going to require some resources, that means some uh, taxes now, that will cause certain amounts of pain, that are then well distributed to look towards the future. And maybe we, what we do won't be effective, but I can tell you if we do nothing, it's, not, right. it's going to be effective either. And, and sort of the paralysis of action that plenty right. of people have talked about in, in the current democratic society for all sorts of reasons is as worrisome as anything that's happening inside the market. Right. Well, let, let me, I mean, yeah. you're, you're head of a, a, a wonderful public institution. Yeah. In the account you've just given, the sense in which we're always faced with this choice, it's either yeah. market or state. Yeah. And I just wonder what the role, uh, part yeah. of the issue here is we, yeah. we used to be very good, yeah. uh, in America particularly, at mm -hmm. creating new kinds yeah. of institutional forms for solving yeah. public problems, higher education being one of yeah. them. And we've kind of stopped building yeah. institutions. Yeah, so I want to say, that I, I, don't, I think the whole concept of its market or state is a miscon. And if you yeah. look at our history, you know, where have we been effective with these, as you say, these new institutions? Some of them in the market, some of them in the public sphere. It's, they've been, why they've been effective is they've been complementary, right? right? That the, 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 the public sphere has done things that helps the market work better. And the market, in turn, has done certain things, whether it's economic growth that you know, feeds some additional, that, that also gives resources to the public sphere and helps it work. And it, it's the complementarity and viewing these as opposed to each other, as opposed to working together in ways that make all of society better off. Is, 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 you know, right. is, so what, what do you yeah. think the role yeah. of economics is yeah. in actually shaping our imaginations of our public life? Because yeah. part of that dichotomy yeah. between state and yeah. market is a kind of economistic story about yeah. reality. Yeah. And it seems to be part of the challenge for the church is to kind of, we, we've, we've bought that story. Mm -hmm. we, we can't imagine different ways mm -hmm. of organizing social things or even giving a true account yeah. of actually what's going yeah. on because yeah. we, we yeah. all see it through this economistic yeah. frame. <laughs> and, and so if we're going <laughs> to develop a moral yeah. vision, yeah. and develop a, a account of what's really yeah. going on. Yeah. How, how, how do we need to challenge economistic ways of thinking and imagining the world? Yeah, you know, and part of the problem is we, we've become, we don't think about markets just in terms of our economic life together. We think about markets in, in cost-benefit analysis is in, in so many ways. I mean, I, one of the things that I quote in my book, which is, you know, the, the Ann Landers phrase when someone um, would write in and say, I'm having marital problems, was always, well, are you better off with them or without them? Now, that's a market way of thinking, right? That's not marriage is a sacred institution and you should figure out how you work it out and you know, go talk to your pastor and get counseling. Are you better off with them or without it? So, you know, individually, you make a decision on your cost-benefit analysis of your self-interest and you leave them. If, you know, yeah. you know, and, and so, you know, so, so markets have been so powerful that they've gone well beyond um, the, the economic realm and you know, we think about in a market and a cost-benefit analysis in our individual lives, in even our family lives, in ways that I think might have been less true 100 and 200 years ago. And um, so the, if the question is, how do we recreate a sense of community that goes beyond self-interest? You know, I don't know the answer right, to that. Right, right. But I do believe that the public voice of the church or of some group that can talk about moral values and moral valuations and other frameworks beyond the market framework has to be important. It's not that I want markets to disappear and to go away. It's that I want some counterbalancing forces that have at least a little bit of strength and it's not all market-based thinking. I mean, I think part yeah. of what I'm getting yeah. at is actually the pervasiveness of that framework yeah. Yeah. has even shaped how we begin to imagine divine human yes. relations. Yes. So that yes. we, whether it's something like the prosperity yeah. gospel yeah. or yeah. other, we, we tend to view our relationship with God yeah. in the kind of cost-benefit terms. Mm -hmm. and that, Mm -hmm. How do we kind of reverse the traffic? So it's not imagining God uh, in relation to the market, yeah. but imagine the market in relation yeah. to our relationship with God. And yeah, I don't yeah. know if you have any yeah. wisdom. And I mean, that, that's definitely a question for theologians more right, than right. it's a question for economists, right? right. Yeah. I mean, Brilliant. one of the things, I, one of the more interesting things I did, uh, this is my sort of last foray of really substance into this was. Um, the Pope Benedict had written an encyclical on uh, some uh, issues Caritas around is Christian faith. Yeah, and um, the uh, there, there was a group of American, I think, largely Jesuit-driven, that were holding a meeting in Rome around this, and they wanted to discuss what this encyclical had to say about the United States. And um, so it was this whole group of Catholic theologians, most of them Jesuits, and they needed. Um, 
<laughs> they needed gender diversity, and they wanted a Protestant, right. and they wanted someone who knew something about economics as opposed to theology. And as far as I can see, I was, the, I was the only person who fit all of that. So I got invited to spend five days in Rome uh -huh. at this really intense set of conversations. Right. And um, uh, you know, it, which is just fascinating, because that's not a world I live in, and I, in, in many, many ways. But um, one of the things that we had a lot of conversations about was the concept of gift, right? And what are gifts, and how do you think about gifts in um, both, you know, it, you think about this in your family life. I mean, you think, of, you know, gift is another way, I guess, of saying other interest. But, you know, wh where do we give gifts, and when are you generous, even when it brings nothing back to you, right? If you think of gifting as doing something that will not return to you, mm -hmm. in, um, uh, you know, what, and, and how do we bring the idea of gift back into our common life together? Because we're so used to thinking that, well, you're only going to do this if it, does something for you, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, if we think about what should we be doing that is regularly gifting of other people in our life, and I, it's a fascinating mm -hmm. way of, of framing that that I admit I, I hadn't thought of. Right. So it's a very it's a very big yeah yeah. I mean, I don't know nothing about No, no, no. It's yeah. a wonderful yeah. rich. That's been yeah. Yeah. this question of yeah. how do we restore some yeah. sense of the, yeah. the gift as yes. against yes. kind of property yes. Yes. and the, the yes. dominance of yes. property-based yes. exchange yeah. as as yeah. the kind of form. Just what just one last question before before I open it up. I mean, I think. Part of this gets at with economic, economics and the market model is this very powerful mm -hmm. um, model that, that kind of draws lots of things into its frame of reference and, and it has a kind of certain anthropology. I, I wonder if you comment that is, is part of the power of that is because we're very nervous about making moral claims in public. Mm -hmm. In a sense, to come at things via economics somehow seems neutral. But have we made a mistake that actually it's not as neutral as we thought it was? It, it itself carries certain moral commitments, certain kinds of anthropology. Well, I mean, what, one can certainly argue that um, a statement of self-interest is a moral statement, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that if self-interest trumps all else, um, a statement that choice is neutral, and any choice is equally good than any other choice, is a moral statement, mm -hmm. you know, in opposition to the fact that there are good choices and bad choices. So, I mean, there's certainly values built into an economic model of self-interested behavior. They're right. different values than that what is built into most Christian models, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's yeah. That's brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. So let, let me own it up to questions. And um, mm -hmm. I think there's a mic roving around and even one up upstairs uh, for those who are uh, sitting in the lofty galleries. Um, questions? <laughs> there. So, yeah. uh, first, I, I just thought this was funny. So I, I hear a lot of talks where I hear people talk about mm -hmm. very dramatic shifts in uh, technological changes mm -hmm. that are disrupting society. It's always fun as a public video because people have been saying that since I was born. Uh, but so I wanted to think a little bit more about this. Um, you pointed out that often. Oh, thanks. You pointed out that often there can be uh, a big difference between wanting to do good mm -hmm. and knowing how to do good, mm -hmm. right? And so I want to think about these questions of technological change, of climate change, mm -hmm. uh, these very complicated issues that require mm -hmm. often lots of scientific and technological mm -hmm. background to, to really fully understand the depth of it. Um, how does the church project an image of right action uh, for these issues that, that often the church as an institution may mm -hmm. be ill-equipped to really understand mm -hmm. and deal with? Yeah. So, you know, I would very much say that you can't approach those issues just as a theologian and solve them, right? But I would also say if you approach those issues purely as a scientist without paying attention to what are the larger, you know, long-term community and social and economic implications of them, you probably um, aren't going to come to a very satisfactory solution either. So, you know, this is where, you know, there's all this literature that says the more diverse the group, um, under certain circumstances, you get to better answers. Um, and um, we are very good when we talk about the, you know, the scientists get together and talk about this, and the economists get together and talk about this, the theologians have their stuff, but um, what we need is to get more people in the room together, and I'm part of, you know, what I've been trying to say here is that the, you know, speaking as, uh, the, the Christian framework, for me at least, provides a helpful set of questions that I would not be asking 
if I looked at this just as an economist, or if I looked at it just as a biologist, right? And they are questions that I think need to come into our discussion of those issues. So it's not that the church could come in and solve these problems, but that the voice of the church and some of the moral valuations and teaching of the church are an important part of the conversation that we need to have as we look at these issues. You know, it's one reason I became an economist was I was interested in distributional issues and sort of economic well-being issues, but I was very frustrated with a lot of the volunteer work I was doing with all of these wonderfully well-meaning people who I really thought just didn't know anything about it, right? They just wanted to do good and they had no idea how to do that. And you know, they were sort of bumbling around. And um, so I said, you know, well, I wanted to know something. And you know, whether being an economist was the right answer to that, I don't know. But you know, I became an economist in part because I thought I could contribute more to this discussion as an economist rather than as someone who didn't have those tools and just wanted to do good out of some more idealistic perspective. And that's probably unfair to a lot of people who are in those conversations, but I was young then. And, um, you know, and, and, it's, and bringing, you just have with more diversity in the conversation. And I, I do think particularly some of the moral statements and moral valuations and the community issues have to be part of the conversations in ways that they would not naturally be in the absence of some voice to the church. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a Christian church, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was interested in, um, you talked about how the church should have more of a voice in the market and the political system and collaboration between theologians, economists, and the government. How do you address separation of church and state while imparting Christian morals and values into the market system? Um, obviously not everyone mm -hmm. shares the same values mm -hmm. as the Christian church. Mm -hmm. So getting our ideas out there without yeah. Yeah. Uh, neglecting yeah. the views or, and opinions of others in so the market system. Let me answer that in two ways. And the first is that I do think that ch the church community as in a local church community, you know, this is a place for individuals to talk and to interact and to think about how their Christian faith should influence their life together, including their involvement in civic life. So that there is a teaching role and a discussion role and a mentoring role for individuals who then go out into public life and hopefully behave, you know, they, they may not be overtly Christian in that life, but hopefully have learned something that changes a little bit the way in which they behave. So that's one answer. I mean, but I think the second answer, and I, I, I tried to say it earlier, is that I think the church has a preaching voice here, but to be effective, and this is a real challenge, to be effective in the complex and heterogeneous world we live in, the church has to learn how to use that preaching voice in a way that does not speak only to the believers in its congregation, right? So if I'm gonna argue that um, caring about the poor should be one of the responsibilities we all have, my guess is not everyone in this room shares my particular faith. And I have to be able to make that argument, not just out of my faith, but also in a way that is persuasive to others as to why this is important for our life together, important for caring for other people, and maybe, you know, and, and it evokes a variety of other, you know, of beliefs that others may have that might not be at all at their basis Christian, but which nonetheless motivate people. So the church has to learn better to talk about some of these issues without talking only in a, and, and that's a very slippery slope because you don't want the church to be just another voice out there, right? But you know, it's, it's not, you know I'm, I'm not saying the church should take over the government, right? As I said, I don't think they can solve these problems any better than anyone else. But um, uh, if we believe that there's certain things that should, you know, we should care about climate change and its effects on the poor in particular, I've got to persuade you of that, even if you aren't, don't belong to my same church, right? And I need a language for that, have which you, we have don't you, have. Have you, in, in yeah. your time in government or, or mm -hmm. elsewhere, have you, have you come across good examples of that? And, and have, have people lobbied yeah. you effectively in your role? You think, well, that's a good, that was a good version of that. So, I mean, I actually think the organization that I've seen that I think does this more effectively than anyone is bred for the world. Right, right. Um, and those of you who know this, this is a, it is a explicitly Christian-based group that works on hunger issues and advocacy for on, on policies relating to hunger um, within the United States, primarily for U.S. policy. But um, they are very adamantly um, cross-Christian and even at times, you know, sort of cross-religious and try to work on this in a way that is not exclusionary to people who may be coming at it from 
somewhat different religious perspectives. Now, that's talking across religions and not to non-religious, but right, right, right. Um, they have been over, what, 30 years now, right. amazingly effective at holding together a coalition of very diverse religious groups from the far right to the liberal left to the Catholics, and, right, uh, you know, right, it's, right. it's, you know, so there, there are some right, examples some of this. Yeah. There's often help to pitch it. Yeah. Other, other questions? I'm curious to hear your thoughts about um, kind of the positive normative distinction in economics. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of what Luke's questions boil down to mm -hmm. is a lot of people don't think that a positive economics exists, mm -hmm. but almost all economists yeah. will argue very strongly yeah. that we're not proscribing, yeah. we're describing, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just Curious yeah. what your thoughts yeah. are on that. So, I mean, I've always been very dubious about the idea that um, economists are particularly neutral and, um, you know, non-judgmental, and uh, because you know, economics is just a tool, right? And um, and that usually, as at all the way people use it, um, you know, we are human beings, and as human beings, we have certain belief structures, and they really affect how we come at issues, right? You know, there's a large literature on. Um, you know, the way in which, um, how your belief structure affects your scientific outcome, outcomes in a whole variety of different sciences. And um, I guess I, I do think that we all have some belief structures that affect what we, so, so the idea of science as neutral and that anyone actually is fully and truly neutral and, and purely um, inquisitive without bringing any value structure to it is not only not true, but it's not clear to me you want it to be true. And it goes back to the issue that I do think that choices do have moral valuations. And so, and particularly if I'm talking not just about individuals, but if I'm talking about the impact of all of our life together, um, things that we do can affect, you know, affect that community in important ways. So, um, Although I, you know, I don't believe the people who say that economics is not a positive side. I think every science comes, you know, has its own side. But um, not only that, I really do think that trying to think about um, some of the positive aspects of, you know, using you know, positive and the, the aspects of science as um, how a certain moral position can affect you and how it may influence your behavior is an important thing to do. I mean, I, I, you know, I, uh, not only do I think economics is not positive, I think there's actually ways in which it should be more positive than it is. People should recognize that and talk about that. It would be better if we debated some of the value outcomes of various economic policies um, than presenting them as this is eminently neutral and I'm doing this simply because I'm, a, I'm an observational scientist. I mean, that's, that's usually not very believable. Yeah. Uh, let's just take something that's happening this week. Mm -hmm. uh, raising the minimum wage to $15 mm -hmm. in California and a living wage. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, companies and mm -hmm. businesses are already saying that's going to uh, cause them to go mm -hmm. more into automation mm -hmm. or robotics or to mm -hmm. uh, fire people. Uh, when you have these different, the market operating like that, and then you have government and you have the church, I mean, the government could could create new regulations that says you can't do that. I'm going to tax you if you have mm -hmm. more automation. Or the church could say mm -hmm. what the moral view is, of, you, know, mm -hmm. you need to be kind. How does this, uh, an example like that, how does this process work where yeah. these different voices somehow can come together yeah. versus what yeah. normally happens? So again, you know, there's, no, there's no obvious, you know, people can disagree on this. I mean, I have long been in arguments about the minimum wage with many people in many different places and times. And I'm a very strong believer in minimum wages and a strong believer in minimum wages for a variety of reasons. And one is that I, I do think that people who work full time need to earn enough to be able to support themselves and at least some family members that, that there's a value to work and a incentive structure that you want to put in place in society. And you know, minimum wages, but the other reason I think to support minimum wages is that it forces employers actually to treat workers as an investment. You can't use them as simply a purely variable cost because if you actually have to pay a worker $10 an hour, you better, they better be productive enough. And that means you have to provide a, a workplace environment that workers can actually be productive in. So you know, without the minimum wage, the, the issue is sweatshop factories where um, you know, I, 
I produce $2 an hour, I get paid $2 an hour. You know, the factory's crummy, the equipment's bad, but, you know, I'm being paid my, my, my value. You know, it, it, it forces employees, it, it basically drives out some of those sorts of employment situations. Now, all of that said, um, you know, the higher minimum wage goes, the more negative effects you have. And this goes back to the issue that there's no such things as policies that are purely good and purely bad. They, they have mixed effects on different people. And my evaluation of minimum wage is I think you want a minimum wage. There's social reasons that some of it comes out of some of my commitments about, you know, the poor and the dispossessed and wanting to value their labor and make sure that they, ha you know, can adequately survive. But, um, the economist in me also says that you've, you've got to balance the costs and the benefits, and there's a point at which minimum wages become too high, and the benefits clearly become less than the costs, and the disemployment effects are big. Now, that's an empirical question, right? At $10 an hour, what are the disemployment effects of a minimum wage? How does that compare to $15 an hour? And where do you draw the line between those? And honest people can disagree on that, but that's a research question, right? And we can go in and look at it and agree on a methodology and come up with a set of results and decide, how big are those effects? Um, and you know, what, once, once we've agreed that there's a value to minimum wage and the question is sort of where do you set it, you're in a different world than if you're arguing about do you have a minimum wage at all, right? And I would say the value question is about do you have a minimum wage and then there's an empirical question of where do the costs and benefits weigh out. And so that, uh, let me yeah. pick up on it because I think that yeah. I want to connect those two questions yeah. in, in kind of rather interesting ways because that in a sense what yeah. you've just laid out is a, is, a, is a very real example which calls forth uh, the need for prudential judgment. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of moral reasoning going on mm -hmm. here. You gave a kind of you, mm -hmm. Some ways, a utilitarian consequentialist mm -hmm. account, which is, mm -hmm. tends to be how economists yeah. approach things. Yeah. So there's a, a one kind of moral reason mm -hmm. going on in there, dressed up as well. Mm -hmm. What does the data say? Mm -hmm. Now we, we're well, clear that but, there's. But a, I mean, I think the argument for a minimum wage is not utilitarian. Exactly. Right? Right. So yeah. so there's a certain kind yeah. of other moral yeah. commitment, and this is yeah. where I think the goes back to the positive kind of how we evaluate mm -hmm. the role of econ econ mm -hmm. economics in how we come yeah. to determine these kinds of prudential judgments. Yeah. And, and in, in, inevitably, in any judgment about that, you're yeah. going to have a bunch of policy people and yeah. politicians. Yeah. And so it's never just an economic yeah. decision. It's what can the people Absolutely. bear. It's a, Absolutely. What, what, what's going to cause a riot and revolution and what's going to actually mm -hmm. enable people to thrive. So there's a whole yeah. set of political, social considerations. Mm -hmm. And I just, coming out of your experience in government, it be interesting to you reflect about the kinds of moral deliberation that go on a around these mm -hmm. prudential scenarios. And, and, and that's probably, uh, my hunch mm -hmm. is that that's mm -hmm. where, and certainly my experience mm -hmm. in the UK, that's where you see very explicitly these mm -hmm. different kinds of moral commitments come into play. But often mm -hmm. we're doing it at a secondary yeah. level over policy yeah. and, 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 and yeah. kind of lived outcomes when actually what's really driving yeah. it is what are our moral commitments? Yeah, and I think. I think the most important way in which the moral commitments come into play, as I've seen it, is which issues do you put on the table, right? right? You know, are we going to argue about minimum wage? Are we going to argue about government regulation? Which of those are right. more important? Which of those have the bigger positive or negative consequences for the people that I care about, right? right? right, right, right. And, you know, that's where, you know, I think, you know, there's, so, you know, what, what, what's the agenda that, you know, in any political environment, there are only so many things you can waste political capital on, right, right, right. In, in any period of time. So, the, you know, people will really say, no, we've got to talk about this because this is really important. And mm -hmm. what they mean is there's a moral, you know, they don't mm -hmm. quite say it this way, but there's a morally compelling reason why we as an administration have to take this issue right. on, right? Um, and then that becomes the agenda item. And then you go into a whole set of yeah, utilitarian yeah, yeah. and scientific right, and economic analysis right, right, of, right. well, what are we going to do about it? But right? that, and, that would and, seem to yeah, suggest yeah. there's quite an important yeah. role there. Yeah. We can think yeah. of um, some very yeah. good examples of this, of where actually the role of the church mm -hmm. in, in setting the frame mm -hmm. is key. So yeah. in the UK yeah. context, yeah. and I think it was called the One Campaign yeah. here, but in the yeah. UK it's the Jubilee. So no one was really thinking yeah. about third world debt and debt restructuring. Yeah. It's a massive economic, there's lots of, you know, but, yeah. but actually the, the key contribution of the churches mm -hmm. and other religious communities was setting a frame mm -hmm. through the biblical mandate of Jubilee mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to say this is a problem that governments should address. Mm -hmm. I think before that frame, right. it wasn't on the table for discussion. I so don't disagree be, with that. That right. would be a kind of an right. example right. of where right. actually nice the, the church is, right. the, yeah. the work of framing yeah. And the, and, and the yeah. work of setting 
things up so that they become and, questions of moral and political concern. And to go back to your earlier question, even those who may not believe in the Jubilee concept, mm -hmm. upon hearing that, a coalition of interest in working on debt issues grew up that included a lot of people right. who were not, not, not coming yeah, out yeah. of that, that particular yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, biblical framework. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and, but that framing of it pulled them in, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just an interesting yeah. contrast. Yeah. One, one more question I think we've got time for. Yeah. Yeah, one more. Uh, right. Andy. Thank you, Mayor. It's been a very interesting talk. Uh, going back to one of your fundamental statements, uh, mm -hmm. you seem to say that market economics are essentially good with maybe incidental evils. Mm -hmm. um, but some have said that the command to love the neighbor would say that market economics have inherent evil, mm -hmm. that the nature of a market will necessarily mm -hmm. drive it to dispossess mm -hmm. our neighbor, especially when that neighbor is a Samaritan rather than a Judean, or in modern terms, say, a southern Mexican who can no longer sell his crop mm -hmm. because of NAFTA. Mm -hmm. What would be your response to that? So um, I understand that there are people who will fundamentally disagree with me on the value and power of markets. Um, and my reaction is, you know, that, you know, it's sort of this classic statement, right, of, um, you know, there, there, there is no such thing as a perfect economic system, but everything, but, you know, everything is bad, but markets are better than anything else. I mean, sort of that, you know, you know, and, and, yeah, and I must say, I, I believe that pretty strongly. I don't think that any other system of redistribution in a complex society, I mean, there may be some others, if you're talking about some more simpler societies, in a complex society, I don't know how any of this works without using markets in a pretty strong way. Now, again, what limits do you place on it? How much do you constrain them? What type of regulation? Those are valid questions. But you know, the presence of NAFTA um, simply said actually that we lifted certain constraints on markets, right? And we could have had the you know, obviously people were on the other side saying those were not constraints we should have lifted. We should have left those constraints on. That's a question of how far do you let markets operate. It's not an indictment of markets in and of themselves because no one thought that you shouldn't allow trade between the 50 United States that flows pretty freely, right? The question was do you then expand that border to the south and to the north to include Canada and Mexico? Um, you know, that's. We can debate again the pros and cons of that, but I, I, that, that's not a debate about the value of markets. That's a debate about the extent of markets. Excellent. Yeah. Rebecca, thank you so much. It's very rare we hear from someone who's both experienced in multiple different fields and uh, can integrate that with a, a, a wonderfully compelling picture of how your Christian faith shapes the very different hats you've, you've worn. And so thank you for being with us this thank evening you. and your sage-like words. Thank you all words. for coming. Thank you. Yeah.